It's 459. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the council meeting. Glad to have you here. Welcome to our gallery that's here. Glad to have you all here. Thankful for the media coming today. Welcome. And uh, before we start, we'll have an opening prayer by Councillor Court. Please. Yep. Our Father in Heaven, we're thankful for many blessings. We're thankful for the opportunity of living in this free and beautiful country. Please bless those levels of government that have say over the people that they will they will be wise in their choices. Please bless us as a council that we may do what is right for the town of Karsten. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 For the benefit of the uh, audience that's out there watching this on the cable TV when it's uh, shown, um, this is the meeting of the Committee of the Whole held on May the 1st, 2018. Um, welcome to our viewing audience. Uh, call the or to order now. Um, you've looked at the additions and uh, is there any additions to the agenda for tonight? Seeing none. I move to you, adopt you move? the agenda. Mayor Cronin, move to, to adopt. All in favor? Okay, so we've got Mr. Robin Hefner here tonight. I get to go first. You're first. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just don't ask for any more money than you already get. <laughs> I'm not here to do that. I'm going to start a presentation. <laughs> Robin is the, uh, is the Chinook Arts uh, Regional Library uh, CEO. 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 And uh, I work with him on the Chinook Arts Board and on the Finance Committee for the Chinook Board. And uh, Rob is very capable and we're glad to have you here to discuss with uh, our council what your role is and what our role is. So That's glad exactly to have you here. Yeah. So thank you very much for your time this evening. It shouldn't take more than 10 minutes or so, although if you have questions, uh, we can talk as long as you want. Uh, the purpose of my visit is, um, as Dennis mentioned, I mean, Councillor Barnes mentioned, uh, purely informational. So uh, we every, every municipal election we like to go out and visit all our members and by we I mean me. <laughs> right? um, talk to uh, our new councillors and uh, for those who've been on council previously just give you a bit of an update of what Chinook Arch is, what we do, how we fit into your local library service and um, just how things are looking in the library world in general. Uh, so yeah I just have a, a quick outline. I, I sometimes do uh, PowerPoint but this can be conversational. I don't think the PowerPoint has a ton of value. You do have a copy of the presentation in your packages there, along with some other stuff. We've got our annual impact report, which is sort of a one-pager on what on what happened in 2017. A bit of information about regional library systems in Alberta and what we do, and a copy of our current plan of service. And I'll talk about some of those things uh, in my presentation. So just a quick outline. I'll just do a quick overview of regional library service in Alberta, a quick history of Chinook Arch, uh, I'll speak, speak a little bit about our system agreement and our plan of service, um, and then budgets, funding, and governance, which is often the one that's of most interest to municipal councils. The services that we provide, which is probably of primary interest to your uh, local library board, and then some highlights from 2017. <coughs> so Alberta's regional library systems uh, exist to uh, raise the level of service available to uh, for the residents outside of the urban areas primarily. So we serve about 1.1 million uh, residents outside of Edmonton and Calgary. Um, we're considered public libraries under the Libraries Act. We have our own piece of legislation. It's a wonderful 30-pager. <laughs> it's nice to simple, easy to interpret. And that's what governs our activities, uh, the, the Act and Regulation. So basically what we do is we partner with municipalities, or more accurately, uh, municipalities par partner with each other to form regional library systems. And that uh, effectively is, uh, provides a cost-effective way to deliver library services to your community. <coughs> Chinook Arts tends to focus on the behind-the-scenes activities and scenes or activities where uh, you can expect to generate economies of scale by working together. So, uh, and that frees up your local librarian to, to focus on serving your community specifically. Uh, Chinook Arch is the youngest regional library system in the province. There are six others. Uh, <coughs> some of them started in the 50s, but we, Chinook Arch was inaugurated in 1992 after a, about a two-year sort of um, needs assessment kind of uh, exploratory process. Uh, so at that point, 22 municipal members signed on. We've now grown to 40 municipal members. 
the most recent one just joining last year, Waterton, ID of Waterton joined, which was a nice, uh, a nice sort of addition to the services that they offer those few uh, permanent, permanent residents of, of Waterton. Those long, those long cold winters are now a little bit less long than <laughs> people in Waterton. So, and as, as I sort of mentioned before, Shnikarch is actually formed by an agreement between municipalities. So the original agreement was signed in 1992. It's still in effect. It's proven to be a nice, robust agreement. It's survived the advent of the internet and Google and everything like that, and uh, still serves its purpose. So the agreement lays out <coughs> with the, the role of Shnikarch uh, library staff and library board, uh, and also the role of the local library board. And so that's the, the, the roles are kind of differentiated there. Um, because it's a very general document, uh, we have to do a plan of service, which is basically where we go and talk to our members, talk to, in particular, our member library staff and member library boards about how we can best serve the needs of the, uh, of the community or assist them in serving the needs of their community. So the plan of service kind of says what we do and then the needs, uh, or the, sorry, the, the system agreement says what we do and then the plan of service says how we're going to do it over the next brief period. Our current plan of service ends at the end of 2018, so we're just in the process of putting together our, our next plan of service, which will be 2019 through 2022. And we'll, that should come to the Shinnecarch Board for approval at our August meeting. In terms of funding and budgets, our, 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 um, our annual budget is about $4 million, and there's a bit of a chart there. It's probably hard to read in a smaller size. But the two, basically the two chunks on the right-hand side represent the municipal contribution. So there's a municipal fee, and there's also a fee for library boards. So every municipality pays a base per capita operating fee, which I think for this year is $7.85 per capita. In addition, uh, municipalities that have library boards also pay uh, a library board fee. Sometimes the municipality pays that, sometimes the library board pays that. Ultimately, if you trace it back, it's all municipal money. And so that's why we just kind of lump it under the municipal. Uh, we also get a significant operating grant from the provincial government, and in fact, that's one of the reasons uh, that the library systems are formed, is that when you form a library system, it actually brings a whole new layer of granting uh, from the provincial government. So um, it's about a million dollars. So it basically brings, creates about an extra million dollars that is shared amongst municipalities for the delivery of library services. So uh, the levy is set by the Shinnecarch Library Board uh, with the approval of councils. So. Um, when we're drafting our current budget, which will be approved, hopefully, if I do my job right, it will be approved by our library board um, in the August meeting, and then uh, the fee will come out to municipal councils for approval in the fall. And so in order for any change to the fee to be uh, enacted, it, uh, it requires approval of two-thirds of councils representing two-thirds of the population. So, uh, and what that, what that does is it allows prevents either Lethbridge from going on their own uh, to pass a budget. Uh, by the same token, uh, all of the smaller municipalities can't quite get enough population together to pass it on their own too. So it's nice, but a nice balance between the one large municipality that we have and the uh, smaller municipalities which together make up about half of the population of the region. So it's a system that's worked, uh, that's worked quite well over the years. Uh, in terms of governance, we have uh, a pretty large board. It's a one, one member, one vote uh, model, plus a couple of others hang, hangers on. Um, uh, there's a ministerial appointment and one from Lethbridge Public Library as well. So um, it's over 40 members on our board. Uh, and so it only meets three times a year. So as such, most of the work is actually done in committees. And Councillor Barnes had mentioned uh, the finance committee that he's on. There's also a committee for uh, planning and a committee for marketing and communications and then there's our executive committee so by the time a policy or whatever comes to the board it's pretty much been viewed by half of the board anyway so um, not to say that the board is just a rubber stamp there is, of course there's lots of discussion that happens at the board lots of questions and stuff like that so, so the, that that basically represents your your voice uh, in terms of in, in terms of how this uh, in this part of the, the province so any questions so far? I'm tearing through this pretty quick. Here, nothing. I'll proceed to the um, to the services. So this is just a, a quick overview of some of the services that we provide. As I mentioned, a lot of the stuff tends to be behind the scenes. So the big one is um, bibliographic services. So uh, Shinnecarch, one of the things that happened when Shinnecarch came on the scene is that the, the acquisitions and the cataloging and processing of library materials moved to the Shinnecarch facility. 
So your, your local library retains autonomy in terms of what it orders for its shelves and the amount of money that it chooses to spend. Um, but the ordering is done through Schnickarch. And in 2017, we spent $963,000 on library materials collectively for the system. And so when we're interfacing with our vendor, as far as they're concerned, like that's the amount of money that is being spent. And so we get a very good discount on the materials that we purchase. And that basically I extends. Mention, and I, we talked about this at the, the last board meeting, and I asked the question, what that discount is, and it's quite substantial. It's about a 40% discount that we realized by being a member of the board, rather than buying our own products at a full price we, through the Chinook board, they buy all of our stuff at a 40% discount, so that's a big savings. For sure, it extends your, your budget considerably. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so the materials come to Schnickarch, we make it shelf ready, put the stickers on it, and then we send it out to, to your library there. So, it's a nice streamlined uh, process. The li librarian can spend the time choosing the materials and, you know, interfacing with the community, you know, what kind of materials are in demand in this community. And then they just send the order to us and we take care of all the back end stuff, the miserable stuff dealing with accounts and invoices, reconciliation and all that kind of stuff. Um, we also provide a pretty robust IT infrastructure. So a lot of our services are networked, including the system where the, the books are checked in and checked out. That's all managed through Shinnekarsh. Uh, we're the internet service provider for your library. So uh, the Alberta government pays for the library's connection to the supernet. But the supernet isn't anything unless you do something with it. So we provide the internet service. Uh, we buy it collectively for the system. And deliver things like email service. We have remote file storage, um, firewalls, threat protection, so antivirus, uh, anti-spam, all that kind of stuff. All happens at Schnickarch. So that stuff, that, those are things that your local library doesn't have to worry about. Uh, one of the things that the the libraries tend to appreciate is if a computer goes down in the library, whether it's a, a public computer or a staff computer, they can just call our technicians and we'll either come out and fix it or we'll send out a swap computer or we'll even sometimes can fix it remotely or over the phone. Uh, it's a help desk, it's included in the fee and so uh, basically there's no cost for IT support for your local library, which is especially, I mean, I imagine in Carston there are, there's a good number of people that do IT support. If you're in Milo or if you're in Granite or, um, uh, yeah, Granite, or Glenwood, a little harder to find IT support. And if you do find it, you pay for it. Um, so it's a big, a big service there. Uh, public services, so we have four librarians on staff that will basically assist your library with pretty much any anything they need in operating the library. So whether it's a policy question, a human resources related question, a question related to the, the Libraries Act, or um, pretty, yeah, any aspect of uh, reporting, uh, Every, every library, of course, has reporting requirements for the government, so we help libraries with that kind of stuff. Anything they might encounter in their day-to-day, -day, um, we help them with. And if there's a technological question that uh, comes into the library, someone has, you know, they received a, a tablet as a gift for Christmas, they don't know what to do with it, often people will go to the library and get assistance there. So if they exceed the, the knowledge of the local library, uh, library manager, then they, the, they can uh, call us and we'll help them with that kind of stuff as well. So sort of acting as a backstop for any service that your, your library offers. Um, in terms of resource sharing, uh, the, all of the libraries in the system, their collections basically behave as one big collection. So if you reside in Cardston, the book you want is in Lethbridge, you can just place a hold on it and our delivery trucks will bring it to you. Uh, most libraries get two to three stops a week. And so the stuff always arrives very quickly. And for myself, I'm always impressed with how quickly stuff shows up on my desk. Um, how many delivery vehicles are there again? Uh, we have two that go out regularly and then a backup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, which I'm glad we do because I had to use it tonight because our other two vehicles were <laughs> were, uh, were out in the field. So I drove a big empty three-quarter ton <laughs> Ford van out here tonight, which is fine. <laughs> um, yeah, we put about, um, as you'll see on the little, the little one-pager there, we put about 150,000 kilometers on our vans every year, which is, I forget what I think, 16 times across Canada each year or something. So we put a lot of miles on. I know when I mention the people that I work at Shinnekarch, that's what they always, they're always like, oh, you're the people who bring me my books. So, and that's all they really know about us, which is fine, as I say, <laughs> we're behind the scenes uh, as well. So, um, we also have a mandate from the province as of uh, last year or so, they began giving, giving us a small additional grant to extend services to First Nations. Uh, First Nations have historically been unable to participate in library services fully just because it's, it's a very municipal uh, focused service and there was no provision for uh, uh, a band or a tribal administration to even create a library board. 
and access those types of grants. So, um, as you know, there probably uh, there there is a public library in Standoff, which is the only public library on a reserve in Alberta right now. Um, and the, the way they're able to do that is the school authority actually joined the system with the money funneling from the tribal administration through the school authority. School authority. And school authorities can join regional library systems uh, under the Act, and so that's how we kind of made that happen. <laughs> um, but there was still, uh, uh, at Brock, in the, on the Bikani Nation, of course, there wasn't quite the, they don't quite have the population base to get a sort of a momentum going, so uh, thanks to that funding from the province, we can now offer full system services to, to those residents as well. Uh, some of the highlights from 2017, uh, the good news is people are still reading and they're still borrowing books from the library. Um, we find usage to be pretty steady with increases in the digital services uh, realm in particular. But So 1.7 items loaned uh, last year, so that's about 8 items per resident. And that's, that's not per library card holder, but per resident, 8.5 items um, in 2017. Uh, libraries are sending a quarter of a million items back and forth to each other to satisfy patron demand. And actually, Cardston is a huge net lender, so that tends to be an uh, indication that you have a good collection. Everyone wants to access your collection, which is, which is nice. Um, uh, the, yeah, the electronic resources, so if you have a library card, you can, you can go to, onto the library website and download ebooks, audiobooks, music, streaming video, all of that stuff is available, and we're seeing that increase about 10% year over year. Um, yeah, and we added 71,000 items to the, to the catalog last year. So looking forward, um, we spent the fall talking to our members about what they would like from us in the next four years. And what we're finding is that um, the libraries are wanting us to be even more involved in helping them to deliver services. So a lot of libraries would like to deliver programming, but they just don't have the resources. Uh, we can go up to the communities, build partnerships, broker. There's a lot of agencies out there that want to deliver programs, but they don't have a venue, or um, you know they're looking to extend their reach out from Lethbridge into the surrounding areas. So we kind of see our role stepping into helping to broker those partnerships. Uh, we're looking at possibly a mobile services in initiative, so uh, like a literacy bus kind of thing that would come out to community fairs. So if there's a community fair in Cardston or Glenwood, uh, a parade or whatnot, we would send the bus out there and partner with the local library to get people signed up. So it's a promotional tool and also a getting books into the hands of uh, kids and families and people uh, sort of initiative. So we're pretty excited about that. We did apply for a grant to fund that, which heard today that or that grant wasn't successful, but we have other resources as well for funding um, other grant uh, possibilities. Yeah, and we've also just hired a marketing person. It's our first communications person. The libraries were frustrated that they have all this great stuff, and they feel like even in the smaller communities, their residents don't know what, what the library has to offer. So, And we've been sort of doing best effort marketing for 10 years since I've been at Chinnakarch. <laughs> uh, but we're uh, librarians. We don't really, you know, marketing is a science. There's a whole skill behind it, and we just don't have it. And so we're hoping to really raise the bar in terms of marketing over the next few years. And that, unless you have any questions, I think that I pretty much I would you to mention to the group here about the renovation project that uh, is going to go on at the Shimmel Oh, right, yes, that's good. I should, I should put that in my presentation as a matter of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, last year we received, after much lobbying, after many years of lobbying, $2.1 million from Alberta Infrastructure to update our headquarters facility. So um, we, last summer, did an RFP, hired an architect, and that, that uh, we should be breaking ground or s smashing down walls uh, starting in hopefully mid-June. Um, renovating our headquarters, basically to update it. We have a ton of temporary partitions and stuff in our facility, a very awkward flow of materials, so we're hoping to refine our processes. And um, yeah, use this opportunity to update our HVAC and stuff like that to get ourselves ready for the next 25 years. And hopefully our roof isn't going to leak anymore over there. The roof should be fine for a while now. <laughs> we had a catastrophic roof failure a few years ago and we had water pouring into and it was also coming up from under the floor. But we, I think we've dealt with those, those issues. So. Any questions? OK. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. And congratulations. You have a really good library here, a very well-funded library. In fact, I think you were, uh, I was looking on the, at the Alberta government website today, and Carson is in the top 30. They always do a top 30 funders. And so Carson's right up there in terms of your per capita funding that you give to your, your library. So. 
course, you're rewarded with the top-notch library service. So, um, if any questions do come up, you have my card there. It's in the, it's in the folder, and I'm happy to answer any questions at any time. So, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you again. Okay. Mr. Barfus, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. Good see you at the table. <laughs> um, so I'm here to talk today about uh, uh, mill rates, just to further our conversation that we had two months ago now. And uh, at that time, I was asked to go back to the chamber and see what the chamber had to say about it. Uh, I'm here to report the chamber was not in favor of it. Uh, in fact, I was quite disappointed in the reasoning. Uh, the reasoning behind it was there were no members of the board at the chamber that owned their commercial properties and so they didn't feel that it was beneficial to even take a look at it. So I was a little disappointed with that rationalization. Uh, I spoke with a few other uh, local store owners myself just to kind of see where people were were feeling on that. I, I think my disappointment is probably fairly universal there. I want to emphasize again that when when I suggested this it wasn't a case of making the suggestion that this was going to be a huge financial difference one way or the other because it's not. Um, it's more of a symbolic gesture of fairness and uh, and so that's what I'm, I'm not asking for an equalization. I don't think that would be fair either. Uh, but I would request that we see some lowering of the commercial non-residential uh, mill rate in comparison to the residential rate. Karsten currently has a difference of roughly about 71%. So non-residential pays about 71% higher. Uh, Raymond and McGrath are at 62 and 66. Fort McLeod's at 104, so they're way the other side. Uh, Claire's Home's at 87, Pitcher Creek's at 24, way the other side. Uh, Nanton I couldn't get current numbers for, but they're at about 47. And uh, Lethbridge is at 139%. And I don't know whether you've heard recently, but this discussion's been happening in, in the uh, City of Lethbridge's Council Chambers as well. Uh, obviously they have a really big gap there that needs to be addressed from a financial perspective, not just from a symbolic fairness perspective. And so that's kind of basically what I have for you. I, I, I would like to see council make a, a little bit of a move on this. And uh, I think there's room to, to do some of that uh, without making drastic changes one way. <coughs> and that's my, my thoughts. I'm willing to answer any questions you have. Any questions? I guess not. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. You bet. Okay, we have a delegation from STARS Air Ambulance. Welcome. Thank you. I don't know who's going to be your voice, but you're all welcome to comment. Okay, thank you. We'll all stand behind the pretty So I want to uh, thank you, Council, very much. For okay, your you might want to introduce who you are to us. Certainly. So I'm Glenda Farndon. I'm the Senior Municipal Relations Liaison for STARS. I'm Phil Howarth. I'm the Interim Director of Flight Operations for STARS. Okay. And I'm Jeff Morris, the Provincial Director for Southern Alberta Operations. Great. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I thought that, you know, I'd just like to provide you a little bit of a um, brief update um, as far as STARS and uh, what we're all about. Um, I work very closely with your county council as well. So I work with 90% of the councils across the years and we've now flown over 36,000 missions and we are averaging nine missions per day across six bases serving three provinces. So we have 11 helicopters <laughs> in the fleet. Five missions per day occur in Alberta alone and we work with thousands and thousands of 
major gift donors, calendar campaign supporters, lottery supporters, three provincial governments, everything together in order to make this work. Time, tools, and talent are part of everything that we do. Our main focus is always to bring critical care to the patient. So we do have the right um, <coughs> tool as far as the helicopters in order to save time. Saving time saves lives. As well as we work with every, we work with every aspect of um, first, first responders. We also have the tools such as night vision goggles, capability to be able to fly at night as well as universal blood now. Universal blood on board all the helicopters. So we are the first in Canada to bring this life-saving measure right to the scene of an accident. We also have amazing talent in our pilots being able to land in all kinds of diverse situations at a moment's notice. As you can see, these are some different missions there in the background. And we have world-class, well-known and recognized a medical crew in the back of the helicopter. All these components together put together stars and the fact that we can accommodate all sizes of patients. Like little Beckham here who we flew as an infant. So I want to give you an idea. I don't know if you know about the mobile education unit. Maybe you saw it in your community. We were here to work with your physicians and nurses in late January of this year, bringing that critical care piece and bringing that training to you know communities that we serve. <coughs> and the fact that we fly, fly all kinds of missions. So this is just giving you an, an idea of more than 55% <coughs> medical emergencies. A lot of people don't realize that the majority of all STARS response is for the general public. And of course the fact that we are fueled by generosity. It takes a lot of people in order to make this happen and work. We work very closely with Alberta Health Services as well on the left hand side. They provide 20% of our funding. 80% is fundraising. And now I'll turn it over to Phil as well <coughs> to bring you some pertinent information. So, Carson Hospital and how we support it with the temporary landing zone. So, some of the facts and figures that we have we're going to bring to you today is uh, really from the 1st of January 2014 to the 31st of December 2017. There have been 27 missions to the area of Carson. Three uh, rendezvous at the hospital, and that means somebody uh, out in an accident somewhere coming in to uh, rendezvous with us, and they haven't really gone through the ER of the hospital, so they've been held in the either in the uh, ambulance or maybe in a room in the ER, but they haven't handed over patient care to the hospital. Out of those three, uh, we transported one of those uh, patients. And I've got there two no transport. And really, um, we have a, a specialty team requirement to fly. So we have PICU and NICU. PICU are the pediatric intensive care unit, and the NICU are the neonatal intensive care units. Although the, the two of no transport, um, at the moment, we're not allowed to carry um, isolates in the back of the helicopters because they've not been certified. We used to. Um, some of the rules and regulations have changed, so now we cannot fly a patient inside the isolate. And so what happens now at the moment is both the PICU and NICU teams, we will fly them down to a hospital with their isolate that is classed as cargo. And then when we get here, unfortunately at the moment we have to leave them here, and one of their ground transport vehicles will come down to the hospital and transport that uh, isolate with the patient in the isolate back to uh, Calgary for the PICU and NICU. We also have done, uh, from a patient point of view, from a, a Carlston uh, patient, done a rendezvous at Clare's home and also a rendezvous at Fort McLeod. So between those years, 1st of Jan 2014 to December 2017, we have serviced 27 missions uh, into the card scenario. Is this going to point over? Yeah, uh, I think that's the one there. I won't speak to how there Oh, there it is. So, just so you can see, obviously you know the town far better than I do, uh, but I do see it from the air. 
Uh, there's the hospital, and then you've got the temporary landing zone, which is at the Fish and Wildlife um, on the west side of the town. That is approximately uh, 1.7 kilometers away from the hospital. And that then is a, in a closer detail, uh, the hospital honey at the Fish and Wildlife. We understand that the Fish and Wildlife have uh, not abandoned uh, the area there, but they're not flying helicopters in and out because of their mission has changed. But uh, they do have equipment uh, stationed in the um, landing zone area in that whole building complex. And uh, so they do, it, is remain, it does remain open uh, for the Fish and Wildlife people. Uh, it's been moved to the airport now. They moved to the airport now, right, okay. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> so we've had some clarification, ongoing clarification with Transport Canada uh, with regard to temporary landing zones. Um, temporary landing zones cannot be in a parking lot, road or park or area set aside for regular use by people, cars, etc. The temporary landing zones effectively require 180 degrees of approach and departure paths that are free from a built-up area. And the approach and departure paths cannot overfly a busy road that isn't closed at a low level uh, that would cause uh, a hazard or distraction to drivers. And that's through the departure or ar arrival phase. So what does it mean for the town of Carlson? Unfortunately, we have to stop using the temporary landing zone uh, that is at the Cardson Hospital landing site, which is the Fish and Wildlife. There is a solution. It's not a great solution, but one that uh, we can still call temporary is to go to the Cardson Airport. Uh, it's around about eight kilometers to the hospital from the airport, mostly major highway. There is a 24-hour operation and access. It is lit for night operations, although we do use night vision equipment, so we don't necessarily need lighting. And there's also fuel at the airport. Advantages for the relocation, it's remaining close to the hospital and serving the Carston area. It does offer uh, the 180 degrees of approach and departure paths. Uh, the, because it is an airport, they don't overfly the uh, busy road or anything like that. The approaches are free from obstacles. And most of the time, um, we can be able to land into wind, uh, which is ideal for safety for us. Alternatives. We'd like to work with, uh, with town and council here to find another site that is close to the hospital as we can. Uh, it may or may not be likely further away from the present uh, helipad, but we do need the cooperation of the landowners, town, EMS partners. To put it in perspective, um, if the airport wasn't here uh, at Cardston, we would be going to places like uh, Fort McLeod, 42 minutes away, um, less if you have lights and sirens. The Lethbridge Airport is at 45 minutes or less, and Le the Lethbridge Hospital is 53 minutes or less. Um, I haven't included any timing for lights and sirens um, because I don't want to exactly know what they will be doing, depending on patient care in the back. So as I said before, we do like to, uh, we would like to work with the council here to find somewhere that's relatively close uh, to the uh, to the hospital, um, so we don't have that 8.1 kilometer drive. Some of that, uh, about uh, two kilometers, is over gravel, which, depending on patient care requirements, uh, may not help uh, in that situation. Mm -hmm. We're going to work with you to identify something that's feasible as a temporary landing zone. We'll provide information regarding new temporary loan uh, requirements, dimensions, materials, etc., to work. Uh, if requested, to engage potential uh, donors for materials that may be needed and provide information regarding the process of the new temporary landing zone or even a permanent temporary landing zone with uh, NAV Canada, more importantly, though, Transport Canada. 
that's it. Any questions? So like How that? often do you use your fixed wing? Uh, we don't have any fixed wing. You don't have a fixed wing? SARS, SARS does not have any fixed wing. We haven't had a fixed wing uh, for about 25 years, or well, 24 years. So years. then it's Alberta Health that has a fixed wing? Alberta Health has a contract. And it's stationed in Medicine Hat, right? Uh, they have uh, bases all around. So there is Medicine Hat. Um, there's Calgary that will really serve uh, the, this area. So my daughter, 46 years ago, was transported by STARS in an isolate. And so that surprised me that, uh, yeah. that the rules have been changed. Yeah. A lot of these rules, um, they're forced upon us. Um, we're in a situation, uh, now we're in a situation where we can carry the isolate as cargo, whereas only, uh, only I would say months ago, that we couldn't even do that. So if you had a fixed wing, could you carry an isolate, loaded isolate? Um, I wouldn't be able to speak on behalf of the fixed wing. Uh, their setup is different to ours. Right. But I do believe it's a similar isolate. So you're looking at the airport out here as just a temporary solution to the problem that we have? I believe that it is a temporary <coughs> solution. It's up to uh, you know ourselves here today or in the future to come up somewhere that uh, will service um, the hospital and, and its needs with uh, the local area. I think it's important for us to to look at that. Like we talked about earlier, by far the safest place for any aviation is at a registered certified airport. By far. Yeah. But we also care a lot about the patient, and to have eight kilometers of drive on a horrible road just being a I don't mean horrible road, roads are maintained by, <laughs> on a, uh, on right, a route. Right. What's that? It's a horrible road. Well, I'm just yeah. considering the patient aspect with, you that's know, right. a ventilated patient or somebody who needs a bag, and right. a critical right. care patient that we would be picking up. That's, yeah. that's a difficult road to be traveling. Mm -hmm. So ideally, if we could be close to the hospital. Okay. Yourself, that's okay, so you said you can't have these temporary landing zones because of these three reasons. The one that was at Fish and Wild, which one of these things, I mean, it's not a parking lot, so is it because it's the approach or it's the can't fly it's over the, busy road? It's the approach. The approach, it's where it is, is over a built-up area. Okay. And uh, uh, Transport Canada are getting into the uh, more robust situation where they're defining terms. So a built-up area is now defined <coughs> as any building or structure that is in the approach path. And our approach would be mostly into the 90% of prevailing winds from the west. Just so that, in that area, um, you would come in from the west? No, no, the winds would be in the west. Yeah, but you would come too. in from the east, yeah. so you'd have to go so over that's tough, town. Yeah, yeah. To, yeah so going all, the, all that new, not new, I don't know, residential area, that's yeah. that part. Yeah, so I've got the, up there, so there's the Fish and Wildlife. The winds that we drove up there today, have a look. The winds are coming from down here, going that way. Mm -hmm. We like to approach into wind. Uh, that is the safest way to make a landing. And so we're coming down this way. Yeah. So all these buildings here are considered a built-up area. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, we have had an incident this year, uh, not an incident, we have come down to Carson this year, where the winds were very, very light. And so the crew determined that they could la approach from this way and then depart that way. So what, rarity. what do you need as infrastructure for a temporary landing pad? How big a pad and so forth? Well, there's, um, there are requirements. Uh, we didn't bring those today because this is just a, like an introduction. But we've, where the hospital is, oh, sorry. Oh, oh I broke it. <laughs> oh, excuse me about that. <coughs> I can normally blame my son, but he's not here. <laughs> so we did identify something today that we thought might be something, but we, we don't know. But just to the north here, there's some open ground. And it looks like it might be uh, maybe some water tanks buried underneath or, or something like that, because it looked like there was pipes sticking out that were maybe for venting. Is that, sure. the old, uh, the CPR, that right? the old CPR, CPR area? area. They're, they've got, they have, there used to be a, a bulk gas station there, so they're still trying to clear the yes, soil, right. 
and stuff. That's why the pipes are up there. Right. Okay. There might also be a disagreement who actually owns that land yeah. between the reserve and the land. Okay. So that's a bit of a controversial spot. Okay. Be a good spot. So we're so yeah. so you know that's why we say you know we would love to work with you uh, with our EMS partners and ourselves to come up with somewhere where we'd be able to develop it as a landing zone, and it won't be a temporary landing zone. If it is a landing zone that we have that, are, that is not a temporary, which means it's either certified or registered with Transport Canada, there's going to be a cost for that. Now, without going into site specifics, it would be unfair for me to say this will cost you, you know, 40,000 or half a million, because we don't know. So, really, the town, possibly, with ourselves coming up with the criteria, of uh, what is required for the landing zone, uh, we could possibly, you know, identify areas where, where we could go, and then from there, there'll be some engineering costs for that to, to be able to make it so that it's certified uh, for, the, uh, for the hospital. When you're saying we can work in partnership with you, financial partnership, as in, no. is it all out of our pocket? That's where I have had the I mean, I like partnerships, but yeah. I don't like it when you have money. We are a charitable entity. I get it. I, get it. Um, I have worked with other councils as well, other towns, and, and some through the northern area of Alberta, where uh, we are kind of a liaison to work with local community service groups, the county, the town, for whatever may be required. Also keeping in mind that you know, it, it doesn't mean it has to be a, an elaborate pad. Some towns have a grass pad, but the fact that it has to be a registered site or else certified, so those are some different areas, you know, that have to be established. We're first just looking to work with you to identify some other areas within the town that are possibilities. You know, maybe it is town property. Maybe it is one of your residents who is willing to provide that, though, that as aspect. You know, there's lots of different opportunities there. The main thing is that we at least um, start to look to identify some other areas on a long-term basis. You know, like, I know that, you know, councils now are more working on five-year <coughs> strategic plans, maybe ten-year plans. So I'm working with a lot of communities that way that, you know, once we've identified an area, um, that we can establish work together, you know, maybe they're putting back some funds each year on a five-year kind of plan that still reaches the goal that's going to serve this community for several generations to come. Perfect. So Thank you. that is our goal. Tell us yourself. So what do you classify as a built-up area? Any residents? Well, if you look at that photograph there, um, any of the buildings there, Anything, you know, if we wanted to land, say there was a, a patch of grass that was wide open, met all the criteria, we, we uh, didn't do anything, but we just knew it was okay to land there. That would not satisfy Transport Canada, because it is land set aside for the purpose of taking off and landing. So for them, that means that it has to be registered or certified. And so there's a process of that to get it registered and certified. What about this piece of land right down here in the south, along the west bypass, 12th Street? It's called no. the Agar Dome right now, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, what? Shank Lake right beside it. That big plate on the road. It's a homeowner living right What? Yeah. There's a new it's hospital perfect. built there. Right. It's <laughs> just my place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the so, we have to, uh, not only do we work with Transport Canada, but you know, our further health services and the, count, you know, the town as well. Um, ideally, the absolutely best option is we land at the hospital mm -hmm. because we don't have a road ground transfer. And there's can be complicated with a, with a ground transfer. So we, we're taking a patient with IVs and ventilators and tubing and all that sort of thing from a, a patient from a bed in the hospital onto a stretcher and then that stretcher is put into the ambulance and then the ambulance is taken to the aircraft and it, that uh, patient is taken off the ambulance stretcher put into our stretcher and then put into the hospital so there's multiple places in that process where things could happen every patient movement that's risk right 
so, so the question I have, in a larger city, you got hospitals all over the city of Calgary. Mm -hmm. How do you land at their heliports when not, you've got structures all over the place. How does Transport Canada justify allowing you to fly over huge tracts of right. populated places and yet they you have a small town like this with a few buildings. I mean, I, I understand safety concerns, mm -hmm. but then the t they take the degree, it's always about a, a what if scenario. Right. Right. And the thing is, what if you do find a spot on the edge of town? What if all of a sudden there's a developer that wants to build up a housing development around <coughs> that piece of property that we've designated for the permanent right. structure for STARS and then all of a sudden the rules change, right? So how do you get around all that kind of stuff? Well, in the first instance, uh, all the helipads are either registered or certified. Now, the fact for Calgary, because it is in the city, all of them are certified. So when, we, when Transport Canada certifies a helipad, they look at a number of things. They look at uh, so approach and departure paths. So if you imagine a wedge of cheese and you tip it on its side, uh, that is the profile where we fly down to make a landing at the helipad. And we also have a wedge of cheese going the other way. And depending on the surrounding area of that pad, uh, the approaches are called H1, 2, or 3. So H3 is really there's plenty of areas to land in case of an emergency on the approach or the departure path. And so that means a single engine helicopter can use that approach. Now H2 and H1 are more restrictive. The wedge of cheese changes with, the, with its um, angle of approach. And also, depending on whether it's H2 or H1, depends, if it's an H2, there has to be emergency landing sites within 625 meters of the original site. Mm -hmm. If it's an H1, then there isn't any landing areas within 625 meters, but there are now restrictions on the helicopter that can use that. So for us going into areas like the foothills that has one approach as H1, we have to calculate uh, a couple of weights with the temperature of the day and things like that. And we work out that, you know, if we're coming from here going back into uh, the foothills there, it's not going to be an issue because we've just burned, you know, an hour's worth of fuel. And so we'll be well below that weight. But in some instances where we do a very close in scene call, say around Calgary, we really have to work out, can we actually do it? Not only before we, before we leave, to go somewhere, we work out the projected fuel to get there, the apostle amount of time on the ground, work out the fuel burn to come back, and we have to be low a certain weight for that day in temperature. Right. So that's why it becomes an H1. Now, say the hospital was on the west side of town, and the helipad that you've decided to build was on the west side of that. It's not in a built-up area. You don't have to certify the pad. But as soon as you bring it inside what they deem as a uh, deemed as a, uh, a built-up area, then they want it to be certified or registered. So in reality, our only option would be on the east side of town if you want to come in from that direction? Of no, that if it's certified, we can come no. from any direction because they've worked out those, those angles, those slopes, and the performance of the aircraft. Plus certification or registering does protect that. Right. Sorry, uh, that's the second part. So if you do certify the heliport, then there are federally mandated uh, setbacks for building. So if you wanted to do something, then you have to go. I'll serve Banger first and then court. So the negatives on the airport as it is right now, is it the eight kilometers and the rough rope? Yes. So if we went into partnerships, it would be cheaper to uh, go into a partnership and upgrade the road if the eight kilometers does not pose a problem with if your lights and siren. Well, as I said before, the ideal situation is just north of the, the hospital there. Now, I understand that's a concern for you because there's no road transport. So we will wheel out our stretcher, go to the hospital, pick the patient up, come back. 
The other one, consideration, sorry Phil, when you're talking about these patient transports and transfers, what, on eight kilometers, one kilometers, either you have, especially in a critical care patient management situation, you're either taking the physician out of the community, eight, ten kilometers, whatever it is, time, uh, or high acuity critical nurse, or um, it'd be pretty difficult for just advanced life support paramedics. So out of hospital time is really important, as well as patient, uh, patient risk with every movement. So it's not a bad thing. Roads are awesome. It's great. It's the out of hospital time and just that extra, at extra critical care patient management risk. But if you had a building that where you could stabilize before you transport, it, after you after you move them from the hospital, if there's some more stabilization that is required, if you had a building that you could move that patient into that building, stabilize, then transport. Well, you know, we just stay in the, the ambulance in yeah, that case. Yeah, we just go ambulance and look up. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the issue I have at the moment with the BK and the uh, AW is that uh, our stretcher is not compatible with the um, um, ground ambulances. Okay, so. Here. If you finish, it's no, just go ask one the question here. Uh, so, if we find a designated area, we designate an area in town, you'd have to have somebody down here to make sure that's proper area for the approaches and everything else is that the idea the idea is so you still get some to be assistance to be able to certify to make that fit. so we have to find a spot that we have to get it certified by and, and really our goal our purpose here is to tell you the issues we're dealing with and just to be able to come to the community because this isn't the first one actually there's a uh, half a dozen that we're going to within the next couple weeks to identify these same issues and just want to work with council and the community to to help find a situation outside of us just saying you know what we're just going to go to the airport because it's easy so we want to be able to work with you guys that's all. Mm -hmm. The other point I, I want to make, uh, on the north side, the parcel that you identified <coughs> as being interesting, there is a highway in between that piece right there. So when you certify or register a, um, a landing zone, there's a thing called the Helicopter Operations Manual. And that is the one that is stamped by Transport Canada. And it tells everybody what they need to do. So in that particular instance, that if we did go along that route, somewhere in that HOM that Transport Canada will insist on is that road is closed for the duration of takeoff and landing and possibly the patient transfer going across the road. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. So we do that in other places. The idea would be you would literally roll the stretcher mm -hmm. across yes. the highway. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, there's a, it's a bit north, it's a bit west and north of the hospital. Kind of kitty corner. It's kind of up. Yeah. It's well, quite a road. again, we just drove around the other day. Don't think this is our suggestion. We just drove around. Oh wait, yeah. maybe we could talk about this. It's we don't know the community, obviously. Yeah. So we'd like, you know, that's why we've come to. We'd like to work with you. Yeah. You know, the idea is to have it, you know, on the ground, in the grounds of the hospital. That's going to be a major issue here. But as um, it is, just regulatory wise, that's not a good place. So we're going to go to the airport temporarily oh. until we figure something else and out and it's either land ownership looking at sustainability cost information or yeah. certification yeah. Uh, I'm okay do you guys have any landing sites on first nations uh not no good question well we do it okay all right because right. there is empty land right across the highway it yeah. happens to be on the first nation but that shouldn't preclude us from Again, that's questionable yeah. if it is or not, but we can still work with them yeah. on that. Mm -hmm. The only situation there is having to close the highway. There's all kinds of detours. You can take yeah, every avenue. Yeah, no. That's only for the approach. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't worry about closing yeah. the highway. Yeah. Yeah. We do that often in other yeah. situations. Yeah. In other communities, of course. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. for just the time frame. That's not really course. an issue then. No. I mean, there's other ways to detour and go back onto it. We just have, you know, the issues that will be manpower. So you'll have security at the hospital, you possibly have RCMP or even the, like the EMS out there stopping traffic for the, when we come in and when we depart mm -hmm. and when the stretcher goes back and forth. All the other times, traffic is open. Yeah. Right. Free flow. Yeah. So you see that as a preferred place right there then? So no. Yeah. Well, no. well, we're saying it's close. Close. We're trying to eliminate eliminate out of hospital time as best as you can. Right. The best place is under physician care, which are in the hospitals. Outside of that, it's critical care patient management, and then with EMS crews. And eliminating the extra ground transfer, so one less transfer for that patient as well. 
and not way. tying up your ground ambulance as well then. Ideally, you'd be right on that hospital ground on the west side. You'd have to cut all the trees out and open it up there and then put a pad right there because it's probably plenty of rooms. Uh, and you'd have to get somebody from, from a, a heliport engineering point of view to look and at it. And look at it, yeah. It's quite tight. Okay. It I don't think it, you could do it, but I'm not the engineer. Yeah. Yeah. Not. And that becomes a just property management. Right. 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 And Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Nice to know uh, what uh, having opportunities to work with you in the future. We'll go from here. Our Thank family you. has used stars four times. What? Wow. Yeah. So oh, it's. Give up here. That's a good idea. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you. 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 Thank so well, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I'm going to slide my desk over, Councilor Barnes, because we're done with delegations. Thank you, Jack. Okay, so um, moving forward, before, before we go on to the next item, we have uh, minutes that need to be adopted from uh, April 3rd. Maybe meeting. Oh, we should do adopt the May third minutes. Okay. 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 Councilor Bramey made that motion to adopt May third minutes. Any questions? All in favor? Okay. Good. And we'll move on to number six, six uh, A, budget review of the budget. Yeah. I'll turn it over to Jeff. So I, we passed around, and they're only eight and a half by elevens because there's very few things different than last week. So I only have about eight or ten things I even want to touch on based on the feedback that you gave at the last meeting. So when are we going to invest the magnifying glasses? It's, uh, I recognize it's a little small. I struggled with, do I print 11 by 17 for about a half a dozen items that we need to talk about? So here we go. So the, the only changes on the first page, you'll see it says adjusted to reflect TCA budget. You'll recall we added that water line on uh, 5th East. And so when we do that, we take um, our recovered uh, labor and machine time off that project and put it as an income. So we simply amended for the work that's going to be done there. And then other than that, we moved a couple of things within the budget. We added all the delegation requests that you approved last meeting. So those were added. Okay, so right well, I, I'm just generally speaking oh, okay. here because it really is very kind of general at this point in time. Okay. Uh, the only thing I wanted to mention that Hawken and I just caught today, and it's, uh, let me find it here. I wrote it down. 272, oh, if I do. Uh, t <coughs> Hold on here one second. Oh, it was, it was on the very back page. Um, nope, I'm lying to you. Two seven two. Where in the world is my two? Sorry, two seven four. If I could read my own handwriting, we'd be in excellent shape here. It's on page six, the second to last page. In the last uh, discussion, we talked about the library. They wanted to reseal the stucco, and that was a fifteen thousand dollar touch. Hawk and I got talking since then. That's a great candidate for a CFAP application, and the library board would be an eligible applicant. Mm -hmm. And we also talked about maybe pushing that until we had a better ICF agreement with the county. Mm -hmm. I talked to the chair, Mr. Quinton, today. He had no objections to pushing that a year. It didn't offend him at all. He felt that the building is still in good shape. This was very preventative, and it wouldn't bother them at all if we pushed that a year and then had them apply for a CFEP in the fall mm -hmm. for next spring. So I'd like to take that out before we pass this next week. Um, other than that, it's really just the things we talked about. Uh, the only other one, it's the second to last line on the whole budget, 272727. And we had some money in for capital. Well, sure enough, uh, the fuel tanks at the golf course started leaking last week because they were rusted out and had problems. So we had to get some new fuel tanks. Uh, I approved that even though it wasn't specified in the budget. Under the policy, I have discretion up to that amount. And so they're getting some new diesel and fuel tanks up there. Um, and so that was one of the tweaks. So the, the things for tonight, because under the policy for budget, we need to bring you the mill rate bylaw next week. 
so that we can process taxes and get them going. This budget is built on revenue with a mill rate that is the same as 2017. Okay, so we took 2017s and applied it here. Now, in your package, you had a, what we call a mill rate working sheet. Uh, let's see if I have mine handy. Here, Jeff. Well, I'll just grab it here, it's fine. Oh. And so what that sheet shows is essentially we take the municipal mill rate, we take the school requisitions, and we take the home for the aged requisitions. And we plug them in to try and give us an idea of what that means on the average. Now these are not perfect formulas because your assessment and my assessment and his assessment all change differently. So they're based on the average. And the other thing to remember, particularly when you look at the non-residential side. Excuse me. No I'm sorry. Apology. Um, I just want to tell you, just so you know, that we just now landed at Carson Airport for a uh, an incident of three oh, kids. Man. Oh boy. So, yikes. We're here. We're here. <laughs> uh -huh, that's Thank good. You. Man. Thank you. Three kids. Three kids. Yeah. 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 It's a tough act to follow talking about budgets. Um, <sighs> well, we'll learn a little more about that, I guess. It's not good. Well, respecting that little piece of news, um, when we look at mill rate, we're simply looking on the average. So something is interesting to think about. You think about in 2017, we had one building in non-residential assessment that added $600,000 worth of assessment. Mm -hmm. One project over by the post office, okay? So when we look at the average and say that the average increase in residential uh, tax revenue will be X per property, 75% of that can be sitting on one property. So we do the math on an average, but, but really one property could be actually carrying the lion's share of that entire increase for the year, based you know, on those things. The other interesting thing with uh, non-residential this year is because we took the um, golf course back, they were paying the school portion of the requisition as part of the lease. So all that now is distributed back amongst the general uh, non-residential buildings because it isn't sitting on Black Sands. So, those were kind of some interesting implications when we looked at non-residential. But when we looked at the worksheet, um, and it's not the prettiest and most simple worksheet to understand, but if you go to the very bottom of 2018, we can see that we have about uh, $4 million more in, resident in total assessment this year than we did last year. We can see that that's almost all on the residential side because um, we removed the golf course from non-residential, but we added another building, so that washed a little bit. And we look at the real dollars, and we look at a few things. Uh, we have the municipal portion of the mill rate, which is 7.3675, and the school portion, which is 2.556, and the seniors, which is 2 point, or 0.2066. And again, this doesn't flow well, this little spreadsheet, but, but go with me. So what I would say is the residential implication for this year would be 10.1297, non-residential 16.5276. And what that means in rates is that the residential rate would be up by 0.66% because the school requisition is up by 0.66% on residential. So the municipal portion stayed pat, school is up. On the non-residential, it's down 0.59% because the school requisition on non-residential came down. Uh, so that's how that would play as far as percentage changes in the overall mill rate based on the school. Question, Councilor Bangry. Jeff, have you heard anything on assessments? Are they going up, going down? They're, they're up. Uh, so existing assessment, what was it 1.2%? Yeah, like Just over a percent, very minor, plus any new assessment. Yeah, so it's relatively static, but up about 1.2. So uh, Joe and Jane, average home in the town, should expect to see uh, we're anticipating a 1.5% or so increase based on assessment. Um, again, that's playing the averages completely, but uh, that would be the implication. So that's what we want to uh, just get some direction on tonight is if you're comfortable with that, then we will 
build the mill rate bylaw based on that. But if you want to see some changes, then this is it's totally appropriate, and this is the time to have that discussion. Just two things to keep in mind. I recognize that we have to be cautious that we don't fall behind inflation with, with tax rates. Okay, But you're factoring more than just the rate. You're factoring the assessment changes, too. Those are inflationary uh, uh, influences on you and me. If the price of my home went up by 2% and, this, and the rate stays static, I've still experienced a 2% Increase, increase because of my assessment. And the other thing is in 2018, we increased utility rates, not a lot. It's a different kind of tax in my opinion. You're just taxing a different way. So 2018 was the third year of our utility rate bylaw, which saw a minor, but consumption water went up nine cents a cubic meter, for example. So that would be about a 9%. That would be about a 10% increase on the consumption side. And the sewer charge went up a dollar, which that was only just a couple of percent. That was really minor, two and a half percent. So you, you did increase taxation in the utility, if you want to call it that. And just by holding status quo, the average is a 1.6% increase on residential property and 1.5 on non-residential. So we're talking about $26, $28 per household on the average house. 22 on residential, yeah. Yeah, and again, this is on the average, and new assessment's going to eat up a bunch of that. Right. So, but I can't say what your house changed in assessment compared to mine. I, I don't know that. I mean, we could know that, but we don't, we don't run a spreadsheet on every property in town. Um, it's just too cumbersome to even start to, to deal with. Mayor? But essentially, when we talk about inflation, when you have uh, done your budget, uh, presented the figures for us, that inflationary factor is also built in Correct. those figures. Correct. So in other words, that whole budget reflects inflation, therefore it is also reflected within the mill rate. All of our reoccurring expenses, we apply an inflationary piece. So by holding the mill rate, if this is what council chooses, it actually gains us $24,500 in additional revenue over last year because of increased assessment. That's the impact. By keeping the mill rate the same, we actually net 24500 in greater revenues because of assessment increase. So my point of view, to add more revenue to what this mill rate is giving us is unnecessary. It would be adding taxes, a dollar, <coughs> requisitioning more tax dollar from the taxpayer that we don't need at this time. We have reserves and they're well funded. We have taken care of the inflation within the budget itself. Uh, and therefore, I'm satisfied with keeping the status quo. From last year. Court. This may be a discussion for another time, but we talked and we sat down for a day in Calgary with some projects that we wanted to look at and maybe want to move forward with. Uh, if we just keep sitting on this and sitting on this, will those projects that we are looking at ever come to fruition? Is there going to be a time when we're going to have to say, well, if the citizens of Carson want this, we've got to pay for it? You're talking, that may be a later discussion, but we need to we need to think that way. You talk you're talking recreation. Possibly leisure center, whatever else we discussed up in Calgary. No, I I hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Jeff. Councilor Bangry. Major infrastructure now. Are we limiting our our uh, pavement and new services? Uh, rebuilding our pavement and uh, new services? Yeah. Limiting compared to when? Just in uh, that, let's like, say 2014. Uh, no. No, I wouldn't say we are. We're using MSI pretty much. We're using the bulk of that for that purpose. But our MSI is now finished, right? Well, we've got two more years. Two more years? Yeah, we have two more years of MSI. We've been forwarded a big chunk now. We're holding a large chunk for the next couple of years. Uh, but we have two more years on MSI, and we don't know what it looks like after MSI. We don't know what life is like after that. We've been told there's something, but we don't know. I, I would not suggest that we're doing... Uh, less infrastructure as far as underground infrastructure than we were in 2014. Um, no, I, I don't think so. Again, your, your assessments from 2014 are probably up. Well, I can tell you actually exactly. Total assessment 2014 was 313 million. It's 325 million now. 
And so even though mail rates haven't moved, we're still operating on a lot higher assessment over that time. So I guess this comment is a little bit like Councilor Courts. We have some projects, some tourism and economic development projects, like that's going to require money moving forward. So I guess I just want to know what's Council's feeling about those projects. You know, do we do we want to take them out of reserves if we need them, or do we want to start funding them because we know they're going to come to this table sooner or later? Well, one thing for that context, for every percent increase in mill rate, it's approximately $27,000. Just just to give you some idea. So if we said, yeah, we want a 4% increase, well then you've got about one hundred ten grand that you're playing with. Just, just so when you're kicking that around. And I'm not talking about points in the mill. I'm not saying you go from 7 to 11. I'm just saying percent. So, you know, 4% on 7 points, you're only talking three, a quarter of a percent, 0.28. It, it's not dramatic, but it's about $27,000 a percent. So it's not a lot of money. It's not going to fund the project, that's for sure. But, can, go ahead. Sorry. So when we, I don't want to talk about the leisure center, but maybe I'll use that as an example. If, yeah. If we're going to support something like that, yeah. I believe that we can apply for grants and that our, what the town needs to put into that initially is... Seed money. Yeah, seed money for what, seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 and then I guess from there we'd have to operate that, right? But other organizations are going to come in and put their piece of the pie into that <laughs> and it's not going to cost us as much, right? Yeah, one of the difficulties with trying to set this at a point in time is we don't know what those costs look like. Yeah, exactly. It's not developed yet. If we were sitting here with an unfunded capital budget over five years, I'd be saying, yeah, we got to get to here. We just don't know. Now, should we know in this year? Yeah, I hope so. You know, right. I hope we do. I, I yeah. just, I'd be guessing. This is discussion I'm, over time. Yeah. I mean, Councillor Bangu first and then Mayor. So, Jeff, until we get an yeah, intermunicipal so. agreement with the county, and let's say they move forward with their water supply out of our water system. Have we got money to upgrade our water treatment plant? Well, so the only one on the table right now is Aetna. So right. if I speak to that one, Aetna does not require any infrastructure upgrades to our knowledge at this point in time, based on how it's designed and the total uptake that can be on there. And we're going to talk about that a little bit here further down too. But uh, based on the drip system design, it doesn't require upgrades. And the county's well aware of when they start looking at Levitt, Mountain View, and those areas, that any upgrades to the system are going to have to be borne by them if they're going to try and run infrastructure that way. That we've, we've made that pretty clear that, that if we don't necessitate the upgrade... So, for example, for Levitt and Mountain View, in order to treat water at a fast enough capacity, we need a pre-filtration station. So in their design, they're considering that. When they're looking at their costs and all that's being considered of what has to be what has to happen up there to make it possible. So I don't anticipate large capital infrastructure on behalf of the town to to accommodate that. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean that you know we've talked about long term needs for water plant down the road. We've talked about a lot of that, but keep in mind you have reserved seven hundred and twenty something thousand in major utility capital in the last four years. So that isn't going on. That reserve is not going undeveloped. It is being fed at a pretty healthy rate at this point. Now, knock on wood, it depends on utility rates and consumption. But so far, it's been good to us. Mayor, well, to, go, to go back to the need for looking forward and money to fund large projects, I think uh, Councillor Groove is right. You will need to know how much all the partners are willing to come up with. And then you have also another, pos another possibility. The town does not have a debt that is very high. So there is a possibility for borrowing. But we also have to look long term to see if it's sustainable within the budget and palatable to the citizens. So there is all those elements that will have to be weighed when the decision is to be made. 
I, so I think it's a little premature because yeah. we don't have a, a draft budget of anything. We don't know what we're talking about, really, in terms of figures. Yeah. Councilor Self and then Councilor Court. So, Jeff, getting back to my, getting back to my tech dev piece. Yeah. If we're looking at, say, a 4%, you said it's not like a 4% jump. But well, I meant like a four-point jump. So if the mill rate for right now is, is 10.12, I'm not suggesting it's at 14.12. Yeah, right. That's 40%. Yeah, <laughs> right. So I'm talking, you know, 4% on that overall mill rate. So what does that look like in terms of the average household? How much? Ooh, uh, it would, let me see if I can determine that relatively quickly here. 27,000 divided by 1,200. Uh, I've got... Uh, I think I got the right numbers in here somewhere. Just give me one second. So I know that, hold on, I can deduce this a little bit. We know that 1.66%, uh, this is on residential, because we have here 1.66% equals 22 bucks. Per household. Per household, right, on the average. On the average. So high assessment, obviously you're paying a little more, low assessment, you're paying a little less. But we're playing the averages. So you're looking at, at a, if it was a 4% increase, you'd be looking at roughly, was that 50 bucks? Just over 50 bucks on the average. So high assessment homes are going to push 100, low assessment homes are going to be in the 30, 20, somewhere in there. Is what that's going to mean, yeah. Okay. Councilor Court? Well, I would just make a suggestion then that before we get to this point again next year, maybe we should have some of these ideas that we were kicking around in Calgary and we've been thinking about a little bit more locked in, a little more idea of what it's going to cost, things like that. My hope would be by our September yeah. meeting this year, that's all on the table. Good. Thank you know, you. in fact, it's, I wasn't thinking about this this morning, but I have a note to call Dr. Clark and see if I can take him to lunch and see if we can get this thing moving along. Because the intent is that all this stuff is sitting on the table. Well, it was, it was coming from my meeting with Mr. Tollett. Right. Yes. Saying they're going to be coming to you actually in June with a very robust pl financial plan that you're going to have to make some tough decisions on. So I wanted to have the rec center moving along so that we can discuss them in tandem. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's where I made a note and said I got to get some of those folks to the table and get that moving along. So I agree with you, Councilor Court. It needs okay. mm -hmm. it needs to move along. Now, one other thing we could do, Councilor Selk, is this budget is built on the status quo mill rate, but we can take that money out for the library. We could apply that to we could reserve it for uh, ECDEV general right now as kind of some of that seed stuff along the way because we built a budget with 15,000 in so there's no impact if we reserve it uh, right now we can do that quite handily without impacting anything it'd give us it would pay for the tolly uh, feasibility study for example it would fund that and it could fund uh, maybe some study on the trade corridor if we had ten thousand dollars there for doing some research it could give some seed money in those areas as well Really, that's what I'm. Yep, well, you know, that's, that's what, what I'm talking about. I know that, those sorts of things. <laughs> yeah, but there was a little bit of a pot of money. Yeah, so that's something without impacting anything to do with no. mill rate. We could set aside for that purpose when we come back on, on Tuesday. And right. just just another right. question, right. and I know that uh, I think Councillor Court's on the same page, maybe, but we wanted to leave the whole rec facility thing out to to have it citizen driven. Right. So at some point in time, are we going to have to grab yeah. that and run with it ourselves? Like, seriously? But that's, that's a danger, right? But uh, maybe we can create the impetus and then see if there is movement. Yeah. It's always best to come from the citizens. Yeah, and, and I think it has, but I think they... I think they run out of energy or steam or whatever pretty quickly, whereas if it's if we take the ball and run with it, we have the collective energy of this group to keep moving. If we can bring them along with us. You, you know, uh, if you don't mind me saying, yesterday when we were in Raymond, it was rather interesting to see, we, we had a debrief as to how the whole recreation complex, I mean, especially sports field complex, was started. And it was started really by bringing the whole community together in one event that had to do with the radio station and a contest. 
And because of that concept, there are four times together. And they were there. And we're totally behind it. So essentially, that's one issue. If you don't have the town hall, Okay, Councillor, uh, maybe then. You can shut me down. <laughs> but, but I'll be out place. But we, we, just, we just had a delegation on the temporary landing mm -hmm. plot. Can we handle that with this budget? With that budget? No. No. That can said, that can, can we even start to handle it? Uh, no. But don't we have we know the cost. reserves? That, or we have money we could allocate if we needed to. We could, yeah. Right now we were going to work on the airport. Right. And that was the idea. Right. We worked on the airport That's with right. the ideas that Star was right. coming there. Mm -hmm. And we did all the little bit of upgrade for their sake. Exactly. And all of a sudden we realized that <laughs> it's, not it's not satisfactory. How well, interesting. Well, well, temporarily it is. It's their yeah. only option. And how long is temporary? Else to go. It's, yeah, well, it's right. there nowhere. And if you're dealing with Transport Canada, even the purchase of land is questionable. <laughs> But to, to go along with what you were saying, is that necessary to upgrade that road and maybe try to do something like with the type of asphalt we have put on? That's why it's a county bypass. And, and, and that, might be, that might be a way that is not that costly with the county to try to. Jeff, you had a comment on your council Brown. Just to Councillor Bangries to kind of, if this helps. When it comes to the town purchasing land, developing land, putting infrastructure into land, you have a quarter million dollar reserve for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's the best priority and use for the day, by all means, that's at your discretion. There is a quarter million dollar land reserve for the purpose of the town purchasing land and developing land, if that's the best use. Right now, I don't foresee a bunch of competing priorities for it, um, but that's something we could discuss at the time. I might, and, and to that, I'm actually not opposed to seeing if the Blood Tribe would want to partner on that. Oh, that's yeah, what I was right across the road with no right. obstruction. That's what I was, I was wondering. I was wondering if that is not possibly... To their advantage and ours. Yeah. Uh, uh, possibly the need for us to write a letter to the Blood Tribe and kind of give them a little bit of a heads up on what stars would like. Benefits of whole community. Yeah. I was going to say exactly that with the reserve, but the thing we also have to remember with the budget is that if even if we if we throw one more cent into the into the airport, it's still eight miles away. The key is having it closer to yeah, the hospital. That's period. a good point, right? Yeah. So why would we put any more money into a road or one more dang thing out there if it's not sorry, but if it's not helping? <laughs> getting kids to safe, you know, getting getting them to the hospital faster. That's our goal. So if, and as far as working, we know that it's gonna take more than a year to get this done. So it's not a matter of, of that this is going to even be in this budget. Odds are good, it'll come out of the next budget. And by then we'll know what we're looking at. We'll know if the reserve will work with us, if that's in fact where we wanna put it. I mean, it's a thought. I don't think we need to worry about it coming out of the budget right now. Council I disagree. I fast track this thing. We need to talk to the blood band. If they're agreeable, I don't know what it costs to put a helicopter pad down, what you need, but this is what she just it's mentioned three kids need to haul these fuckers out of here. To me, it's a life saving yes. opportunity that we can replace. So I would fast track it and put it in this budget if you have to. Councilor Self? So. I'm still unclear that with the land they're talking about, I think that land is under dispute. Exactly. So we can't say, well, hey, why don't you guys partner with us? And it's like, 
No, I think, we, the, I we think need, the land is under dispute, so I don't think anybody can lay claim to it, period. That's the Marathon Realty place where yeah, the yes. CPR land. Where yeah. the CPR yeah. was yeah. there, yeah. yeah. So I don't think any of that is, is it we're able to do anything with it. Now, my other comment would be, I think, if I'm reading the tea leaves right, <laughs> I think we're all sort of comfortable with keeping the mill right the way it is mm -hmm. for this, but recognizing going forward, that we got to have a more robust discussion about recreation and facilities because I think we do have, and I agree with the mayor when, mm -hmm. if we were to, if we were to approach the citizens of the town, I think we would have a number that would be, I think we'd have a significant number that would be in favor of us mm -hmm. doing something with that. Mm -hmm. I think we have a number of seniors that would, with some of the things we've talked about with that facility, that would be on board plus all the other groups and youth groups so so if I hear what's going on on the table here we're saying that at this point in time we're not going to enter into changing the mill rate for those items nope. leave it as it is the status quo for this budget yeah. and then when the next year when we start talking budget again then we'll go into it in a more rigorous manner to have a more fulsome okay. discussion in September. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we'll Obviously, we just have a more of a plan in June, yeah. September, with, with well, what we're talking. Yes, yeah, some of the stuff they're, I know they're, they're coming mean. back to you in June fifth yeah. with some plans with financial. I've, I've seen the financial plans. They've got good, robust plans put together. So this stuff is going to become clear here in the next sixty Sometimes. days. Right? So I just don't want to see us sitting on it again and again. Yeah. And yeah. 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 It's right. important. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Mayor. Uh, I just want to know, does council want us to direct the administration to write a letter to chief and council to address that need for a helipad? Absolutely. And with the mention that they could do a presentation to them and why they think that location is the best for our joint community. Is that something, a recommendation that I could make. Okay. All right. Council so Bank, we had a comment first there. Before we make, before we consider that, I, I'm along with Councillor Felt that that land is under dispute. Oh. <coughs> absolutely. Yeah, but dispute. I can decide that. One thing I would, if you come further east, it's not. It's that's what the old Bay Area option was. So it's just land, yeah. not under dispute. It's right. just land that is free. As you head free. east or west, then it is agreed. So I'd have to look at the exact. Yeah. Yeah. Two is Marathon Realty. How do you get a hold of them? Uh, I've, I've got um, them. No. Okay, we, 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 we should no, have that. that. Not where Baylog was. That was, that was uh, right. leased right. land from the... Yeah, yeah. Right. some of it has always been reserved and is reserved. Yeah. No. So I make a recommendation to Council that we uh, direct the administration to write a letter to uh, Chief and Council regarding the need of land for a helipad for stars to benefit both communities. Close to, close the, to, the, close hospital. to the hospital. Right. Yeah. So we have a recommendation. All in favor? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. One yeah. more thing I'll just mention because, again, I like you folks to sleep well at night. <laughs> um, <laughs> we like it too. Is that you're in the fortunate position of having fully of having fully funded contingency accounts right now. You have $100,000 in council approved capital, which is just contingency in the year, and $50,000 in council approved operating. And we've been in the fortunate position, we haven't had to spend a lot of that last few years, so we've topped it up and it's full. So that stuff in the year, priorities that come up that you we want to support. Yeah. You know, there's $150,000 there available. There's reserve accounts that are healthier than they've ever been. We're in a position where we have some access if there's a priority. Um, so I, I just, I, I point that out that we're in a position of having fully funded contingency accounts, which isn't always the case. Right. But right now, in this budget, it tops them up to 100,000 and 50,000 respectively. Right. I was yeah. just going to um, ask you a question, Jeff, what your thoughts would be if we were to get the helipad approved, yeah. the location approved, is that something that we want to talk to the county about too, to participate? I, that should participate yeah. in something. Yeah. Like so that. maybe that letter should be going to the county yeah. as well. Good, good point. Yeah. 
Okay. Good point. Yeah. Yes. So maybe okay. we should include yeah. that as a CC to them or okay. something in there. Right. Sounds good. Okay. So that kind of hit both those items on the agenda, both budget and mill rate. Yeah. So, Mayor? So, what is required of this council right now regarding those mill rates is a recommendation for a bylaw to be so drafted? We, you, or? Are, you have a budget policy which requires me to bring you a bylaw next meeting. Okay, so otherwise you will do so that. You, know. yeah. you are getting a mill rate bylaw next week. My yes. recommendation will be that you pass all three readings on it next week because we've discussed it for a number of weeks in yes. a row now. Okay. So that and we're generally all around the table in agreement with it at this point in time anyway. Right? So I will tell you too, we make that recommendation that you pass at the first council meeting, but that is because if there's something comes up, you have a buffer. Yeah. We can pass it in the second meeting. It just gives us a short window to turn things around. But if we run into a wreck next week or yeah. a change of yeah. priorities, we've got options. Right. Yeah. But I'll have it on the table. Uh, Hawking drafted it today. Okay. So I'll have Thank it on the you. table next week. Thanks. Wonderful. Okay. okay. Um, these other items here that we've got here. Um, I'll make a motion to be break for 10 minutes. Yeah, so I was going to say, we've got enough. There's just right. a vegetable platter on the back table. Okay. Too. We have a, recommend, or a motion to a break. We can't make break. To get the motion as a CCW. You can make a motion to yes. recess so it. In, in 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 you made a recess. Yep. All in favor? Sure. Can you imagine if you made a recommendation, you would have to wait 